There comes a moment when the phone rings and you get that, that call and you hear the news that someone has died. And whether it was something you've been expecting for a while or something that was a, a shock, it's important to know, and you're glad that someone has told you this, but you put the phone down next, and it's kind of hard to go back and do the dishes, because it feels like you should do something, right? And this person has died, and then what, well, what, what do I do? What, what's next? It feels like, like you're, you're confused. And I, I find myself wondering this at times. Um, when someone dies, and it's not like your immediate family, it's not someone you have to go and do the family right now, but if it's a friend or it's, a, it's someone in the church or in the community, and, and you think you need to do something, you find yourself wondering, should I go? Or would I get in the way? And if I do go, should I stay for a while? Or should I just go, drop by, hug her, and keep on moving? If, if you do go, you stay, you, you talk, you bring up what's just happened, you let them bring it up. Uh, do, you, do you give them their space because they mean it because everything's going crazy, or do you go to, do you with them and help them? And, and then after the, the funeral, do you, do you keep on giving your friend space, or do you back off? Uh, do you give them space, or do you sort of get, try to get them involved, get them back and doing something, and get their mind off what's happening? And the, as I was talking about doing this, this series, these are the type of questions I, I've been asked by people, the type of questions people ponder. What, what do you do after someone dies? And, and so what we've been, we're going to look at that today, because it's the sort of next step of where we have been, been going. We began two weeks ago looking at the, the reality that uh, there will be a time when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. There will come a time when, when someone we love dies, and we, we need to prepare for that valley. And then there's, uh, last week we talked about how do we individually walk through the valley, the questions and the tasks that occur. Today we look at how do we walk with people in the valley. And this is the paintings that go with this. You notice that there are, there are two people who walk through this valley. And this is part of what we read in the 23rd Psalm. That I go, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil for you are with me. We walk through this valley with someone else. By Ron and by staff, they, they comfort me. And so how can we be a people where our, our rod and our staff might comfort people who walk through the valley of the shadow cast by, by death? It is a journey, as we talked uh, the first week, it's a journey we prepare for. Uh, the last week we said that grief, this, this walk through this valley, that grief is not a problem to solve, but, but a journey to take. That grief is not a problem to solve, it's a journey to take. And, and this week we're going to look at how do we walk with each other, and I want you to hear that uh, grief is not only not a problem to solve, it's a journey to take, and it's a journey to take together. We are meant to take this journey together. Now, before we get into this, I should add what might be a fairly standard disclaimer for me at this point. Uh, I don't know everything, and so I'm going to tell you what, what I have figured out about this, and if you have something to teach me on it, please let me know. And, and there were a couple of times that I was going through preparing and learning and trying to understand what it is, what works best to walk with people through the valley, and I would come up across an example of what not to do, and I'd look at it and say, Oh shoot, I've done that. I've done that many times. And so if, if I say something and I bring something up and you think to yourself, well, I've done that, well, it happened to me too while writing this sermon. We, we always have something more to learn. Excuse me for a second. I was learning about how to walk with people through grief. I came across this, uh, this guy in a theory of a third. He says that a third of people don't know what to do, and so they don't do anything. When someone dies, they don't know what to say, they don't know what to do, they don't know what to say or, or show up, and so they just ignore it. And so that's a third of people. Another third of people will show up and say or do something that makes it worse. And then there's a third of people who will show up and do or say something that, that, that helps. And, and so we're going to use that sort of structure to look at how do we walk with people through grief. And, and the first third is the easiest. The, the third of people who, who just don't do anything or don't say anything, don't show up, don't do, they just don't know what to do, so they do nothing. I believe that what we have here is wonderful and precious, that this community and this church and this family and these friends 
that this is a great thing. And, and so I think what we can, the most easy thing to say is, let's not be in that first third of people. We can commit that when someone dies and we know about it, let's do something. Let's say something. Let, let's figure out something. Even if we as a church have to start calling everyone and say, well, what do we do about that? Let's do something. Because if Jesus says to love your neighbor, then this is part of, of loving our neighbor. When, some, when our neighbor is grieving, when we show up, we do something. Even if we have to figure it out. Now, that's the easy part. That's the first third of people who don't, don't show up, don't do anything, because they don't know what to do. So that, let's not be in that group. The second group is a lot more challenging. The third of people that show up and say something that makes it worse. Or do something that doesn't help at all. When we show up and, and just start talking because we're nervous or we don't know what to say, and we say, it can cause problems. I was reading about this how uh, there were two brothers, I think it was like an eight and a ten year old, and one of the brothers died tragically. And so someone who, who met well was talking to the surviving brother and told the surviving brother, you know, God just takes the good ones. So that other surviving brother, he goes to school, and what does he do? He doesn't do what the teacher tells him. He goes home, and he ignores what his mama says, because if he's good, what's going to happen? God's going to take it. And, and so something that was just meant, just off the cuff, just meant to help, you know, your, your brother was a good, good boy, and God takes the good ones, ended up causing no end of problems for that, that family. And, and that's those... We want to avoid things like that. We want to avoid causing more problems. What, what else might we not say? You hear the phrase, God never gives us more than you can handle? Well, what if you wake up and you don't think you can handle it? If I come up to you and say, you know, God never gives more than you can handle, and you're sitting there thinking, try it, walk in my shoes, that, that doesn't really help, does it? You can say something like, God will help you handle whatever you got. I'll help you do whatever you need, but God never gives you more than you can handle. I, I think we should just cross that off. Just let's not say that. And another one I'd say that let's just avoid is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, because it might cripple you. And, and let, that's just, let's just not say that either. I mean, there's some, let's avoid that phrase. There are cards that, that I see that uh, I look at and think, what were they thinking? There's a card, a grief, a sympathy type card I've seen that says, everything that happens in this life is a gift. Even as you struggle through this difficult time, you are gaining strength and wisdom that will help you further down the road. You know, when you get that card when your husband has died, everything that happens is a gift. I have to say no. There are a lot of things that happen in this life that, that are not a gift. The, the death of someone that's tragic, when, when a person succumbs to addiction, when a child is born and still born, that, none of those are a gift. So let's just, let's, let's not try to sugarcoat it. It doesn't really help. I mean, in the same vein, you see cards, or you see people say things like, uh, we don't understand, but it's God's will. Well, is anyone here God? No, no, we do not, no one here is speaking for God. Let's not speak for God's will. Uh, because what happens is you say, well, that's just God's will, God's plan, and we just don't understand, but it'll make, it, makes, it makes God start to sound like a real jerk when you say, you know, it's just God's will. We heard that, I'm sorry, but it must be God. No, well, let's, let's just avoid speaking for God on that. Uh, there's a couple other ones, uh, especially around children. I've heard people say things like, God just needed another angel. Or, you know, you can still have more kids. Makes kids sound like they're interchangeable. Well, you know, you lost the kids, just have another one. They're like batteries, just throw another one in. And anything that sounds like cheer up, get over it, or move on, stop not having a pity party, just doesn't help. Because it sounds like, you know, I just don't want to help you. I just, I'll be over here. You just get over it, move on. And people saying, you know, it'll all just get better. It'll all get better. I, I've said that. And I, I have to apologize. If I ever said that to you, I'm sorry. It'll get better. Because, you know, that, that's a lot easier to say when you're not in the middle of it. And sometimes in the middle of something hard, that, that's, the, that's the least helpful thing to hear. It's better not to say anything than to say these, these types of things. And uh, sometimes silence truly is golden. And now those are some things not to say. What about what not to do? What we see with, with Job and his friends is a great example of what not to do. 
Because Job and his friends, they start arguing, right? That, that's what they do. The majority of the, of the book of Job, chapter 4, all the way till chapter 31 or so, is a big, long argument. And, and, and to have that type of argument, I'm guessing that Job and his friends have had this type of argument before. You don't all of a sudden just start arguing about the Bible or theology or scripture out of the blue. This is probably something that they've talked over before. And so they, Job and his, his friends, his friends start arguing with him. And he, you see, it's not the same right now because before when they argued, that was before. And now Job's uh, children are dead. And when you're arguing with someone whose children have just died and why it's his fault, that just doesn't go over too well. And, and at the end of the book of Job, God looks down upon these three friends and says, you better get Job to pray for you because y'all done messed up on this. Job spoke honestly, y'all uh, didn't do so hot. And, and so what we see with the friends of Job is they assume that they can do what they've always done. These friends, they get together and they argue and that's what they've always been doing, so let's just do it again. Except when someone dies, things change. A person who's never questioned before might be full of questions. A person that has questioned all of his or her life might not want to talk about it now, might just want to go for a walk. And, and so when we show up with, with, with someone and, and uh, they are grieving, I don't think we can assume that we should do what we've always done with them. And, and I don't think we can compare what our grief is to theirs. I know how you feel. Maybe, maybe not. Why just ask, how do you feel, instead of saying, I know how you feel? And, and so just to avoid making assumptions. What I often see is a, we make assumptions about how I grieve is how you should grieve. This is how I handled it, this is how you should handle it. And, and remember, grief is a journey to take, not a problem to solve. And what's advice about it? How to solve a problem, right? If I need to figure out how to build a house, give me advice. If I'm trying to figure out how to grieve the death of a family member, I don't want your advice. I want you to drink coffee with me. And that, that's kind of how it goes. So don't assume that my grief and your grief will be the same. Just just walk with me through it and, and, and let me take, take the lead. And so that's kind of what not to do. That's that second group. And now the third group, the third, third of people. This is the group we hope, hopefully everyone here is in that group. The people who show up and they do something and say something helpful. The people, those of us who remember that grief is a journey to take and we take it together. And, and so if we're going to take this journey with people, then we need to show up to take it with people. Show up. When someone dies, Go and show up. I mean, even if it's just going to the visitation and the funeral, show up. Show up, go have talk with people, be fighting more to dinner, show up and be part of what's happening with them. Sit down with, with a person and uh, don't try to figure it out. Don't try to give advice. Sit there and let them take the lead. Well, we see this in the book of Job. For all the flack that Job's friends get, they, they do one thing really well at the beginning. When Job's friends show up, they sit down, they don't say anything until Job says something. And it turns out that they wait seven days before Job says something. And, and this is such a powerful way of loving people and walking with them in grief that it, it gets its own name. And the Jewish people to this day, they, this is a practice. When you go to someone grieving and you sit down and you sit with them and you don't speak till they, they speak, it's called sitting shiva. You wait for them because you're going to follow their lead. Now, I would not recommend going knocking on the door and not saying anything, just drinking coffee and being utterly silent. That would be just a little bit weird. But show up and don't be too quick to start talking, which is a bit uncomfortable. But let them take the lead. Because remember, what we talked about last week, there are tasks of grieving, and the other person, the person grieving, has to accept the loss and experience the pain and, and adjust to life and reinvest themselves in this life. And, and whatever the other person is doing, you're there to help them do, do that thing. And it's going to change from day to day. Some days, the person you're with might need this to remember the, their loved one. And you just need to sit there and drink coffee with them and just listen to stories of their loved one. 
Other days, they're trying to figure out how to do their own banking for the first time, or figuring out how to, how are they going to cook? They've never cooked before for themselves. And, and if that's what they need to think about and talk about, well, then maybe it's time for a cooking lesson. But you follow their lead, because they're the ones grieving. It's their journey, and we're joining them on that journey. And a cop and a warning, too. If you show up and someone is grieving a loved one, it might not be pretty, in that, you know, it is true, never speak ill of the dead. Well, never speak ill of the dead in public. Can we say that? Because sometimes the person who's dying, you might just be angry at them. You ever been angry at someone who's dead? It happens, right? Let's be real honest with ourselves. You, when you sit down to have coffee with someone who's grieving, you might have to say, if you want to be angry, that's okay. You can go ahead and let them be angry at whoever they're going to be angry at. It's not exactly the most comfortable thing, but it does happen. And sometimes it needs to happen. No matter what you do, no matter what you, you say, whatever you do say, we need to be honest. For if we don't understand why a tragedy happened, that's, that's what we can say. I don't understand. If all you can say is that's horrible, it's okay to be angry, I can't imagine what this, what this must feel like. If that's all you can say, then say that, and that, that's what we can say. And let that take lead. So as what to say, that, that, that's kind of show up, follow their lead, let them just determine what's going to happen next. As to what to do, well, how often have we said, you know, call me if you need anything? Who here has ever been called when they said that? Me neither, right? I've told people, you know, call me if you need anything. You know what happens? They don't call. So if you're going to do something, and please do, do something practical. Don't say, call me if you need anything. Call them and say, I got some great tomatoes. I'm making chili out of them. Do you want me to bring you a batch? Or you want to go for dinner? Or call me, you know, I'm mowing my lawn. Can I mow yours too while I'm at it? I'm shoveling my drive. Can I shovel yours? I'm having people over for dinner. Do you want to come join us? Offer something concrete. Offer something that they can do right, right then and there. Because if you say, you know, just call me if you need anything, well, the phone's never going to ring, is it? Excuse me. Missouri is trying to kill me again this year. I'm sorry. Ah, sorry. Um, and you know, this whole grieving, it, it's a process, this is a journey you take, and journeys don't tend to be short. And so if we're going to walk with e each other through this journey uh, of grief, it's not going to be something that's done in a week or two, and not even a month or two. If, if we're going to love each other and walk with them on this journey, it's going to be something we're doing for a good long while. And we'll do it until the journey is done. And the only person who gets to decide that is the person who's grieving. And the person who is grieving is the one who's in charge. They're the one who is the expert on their grief. They're the one who is setting the tone. They're the one who's deciding what you're going to do. We're not there to fix them. We're there to walk with them. And so that might be a good thing to pray before you walk in the room. God, help them walk with this person and not fix them. Please just let them walk with them. That'd be, that's a good thing to pray walking in the room with people. And to kind of summarize all this, we're going to walk well with people. Walk with them in the journey of grief. First, we've got to show up. Then we've got to not talk until they talk. Let them take the lead. Show up, talk less, listen more, and do something practical. That's how we love people taking this journey. And when we do this, that is the rod and the staff that, that we comfort people with, that Psalm 23 talks of. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil if you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That is how we comfort each other as we take this, this journey. And, and if we take this journey to, together, if we're going to do this and do this well, imagine what a difference it would make. Imagine what a difference it would make if instead of being a community where one-third of people just kind of ignored death, one-third of people messed it up, and one-third of people did something helpful. Imagine if we, we skewed those numbers. What if two-thirds of us was always helpful? Two-thirds of us were the people that any time there was death, at least two-thirds of us showed up to drink coffee, showed up to the dissertation, showed up and brought lasagna, showed up and offered to, to mow the lawn, showed up and, and did what 
person needed to, so that no one ever takes this journey alone. For some of us, this comes naturally. For some of us, it's something we have to learn. And we can learn it. And we will learn it. Because we don't, want to have, we don't ever want a neighbor to be walking through this journey alone. And if you imagine what that would look like, I think that would make a difference. I think that would make a powerful difference. I, I encourage us to be a church that does not see grief as a problem to fix, but a journey to take together. To follow, and in doing so, follow the lead of other people. To walk with them, to love them in the way that they request, so that no one is ever left alone in the valley. And that we are able to accompany each other until we each come out of that valley of grief that we will each one day walk through. Amen.